Now what this is, this is a mirror, okay? I've used it before, you can tell, because it's cracked. No. <laughs> I'm going to use this box, and I'm going to set this mirror right here, or maybe I'm not. I'm going to use the box with the water. Yeah, there we go. I want to do that because this morning I'm not so much preaching to you as I am to me. Okay? So I, I, got, I got me right there. So, uh, so, so you know I'm not you know, picking on anybody. I'm just preaching to me. And you. <laughs> For right now, the last of our right or wrong questions reads, Right or wrong, our giving to the Lord, should it be our first or what is left over? Now essentially what is being asked is should we give to the Lord first or should we pay our bills and then have a little bit of fun and then with what's left over give a little bit of it to God? But rather than limiting this just to the offering part of our worship, because that is a very important part of our worship, I want to try to incorporate all of our worship into this question. Uh, the Israelites were commanded to give the first fruits as an offering to God. First fruits was a, was a way of saying God wanted them to give their best. The best that they had to offer is what God expected them to give. So our question becomes, right or wrong, God expects us to give our best. And we, we talk quite frequently about giving our best. We talk about uh, giving our best at our job. We talk about giving our best in our schoolwork or on the athletic field and so on and so forth. Always wanting to give our very best. But did you know when it comes to worship, God wants you to give your very best? If you would open up your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, just so that you know kind of where to go. Go to where it says New Testament and then turn back a couple pages. You're there. Okay? Uh, a little bit of help for you. In these verses, God is telling His people that when you worship, I want you to give your very best. I want you to give your first fruits. I want you to give your firsts. He's not talking about what you wear. Now, a lot of times people think that, uh, that, that that's what giving your best means. It means dressing in the best clothes that you have when you come to the worship assembly. But uh, I, I don't think that that's what he's talking about. You know, I don't dress up to impress God. I couldn't do that. I dress up to impress you, and some of you are hard to impress. Let me tell you. <laughs> now, uh, uh, it, I don't think that he's talking about the clothes that we wear. If you want to impress God, you got to look a little bit deeper than the clothes that you have on your body. If you want to impress God, it comes from inside. You have to have pure hands and a clean heart. And you have to give Him your best. Give Him your firsts. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the heart. Don't you want to give your best? I hope that you do. I want to preach my best. I'm a dying man preaching to a dying people. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the gospel, or preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. There's an urgency about the message that, that is brought forth from this word. An urgency that we need to appreciate and understand. We, what we discuss each week is a matter of heaven or hell. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to preach my best. And what is true about my preaching is true also about our praying. When we pour out our hearts to the Father, it should come from the depths of our soul. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And what is true of our preaching, of the preaching and the praying, is also true of our singing. When we sing, we should give our very best. 
Focus on the words. Sing them in such a way that brings honor and glory to God and uplifts and encourages those around you. Now, some of you are thinking, well, the best way I can encourage those around me in the singing time is by not singing. I understand that some of us have... But really, it's not encouraging to the pers- people around you. If anything, if, if you feel that way, if you sing, then maybe it will encourage those around you who maybe can carry a tune in a bucket to sing even louder. And, and it will encourage them rather than discouraging them by not singing. And what's true of preaching and praying and singing should be true with our communion service. When we stop to focus on the most significant event in all of history, we ought to give it our best in focusing and concentrating on what Jesus did for us on the cross. We ought to do our very best to avoid getting distracted. We ought to be focused and concentrating on it. And and what's true of our preaching and our praying and our singing and our communion is also true about our giving. Acts 20 verse 35, we are told that Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. 2 Corinthians 9 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. So here's the question this morning. When it comes to your personal worship, do you give God your best? Do you give God your firsts? Or do you give God what's left over? Do we come to church so tired from what we did on Saturday night that we can't stay awake? Do, do, we, do we come to church prepared to worship God? In Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14, We read these words, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now implore God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not use... You would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will not accept the offering from your hand. My name will be great among the nations from the rising of the, to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane... It by saying of the Lord's table, it is defiled, and of its food, it is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Did you hear what the Israelites were giving to God? They weren't giving him what he had required, has required of them. They were giving him, verse 8 says, blind, crippled, and diseased animals. They were bringing God their leftovers. And Malachi says in so many words, that's just plain wrong. When it comes to worship, then and now, God does not want our leftovers. God does not want a second class animal. And God does not want a second class effort from us. God was very clear in the law about what he required. 
I mean, Deuteronomy 15.21, if an animal has a defect, is lame or blind, or has any serious flaw, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. Leviticus 22, verse 21, when anyone brings from the herd of, or flock a fellowship offering, it must be without defect or blemish to be acceptable to the Lord. And yet, that's exactly what the Israelites of Malachi's day were bringing to God. Defiled, sickly animals. Malachi asks an interesting question in, in verse 8. He says, try giving that to your governor. Would he be pleased? For you and me, you know, when, when we get that lovely paycheck, okay, is that paycheck everything that you've earned that month? It's not, is it? Why is it not? Because our government has already dipped their hand in there and pulled out part of that check, haven't they? In most cases. Yeah. So the government takes the first cut, if you will, of our check anyway. Try talking to the IRS. Call them up and say, you know... I really need all that money that you're taking away. You give it to me and then, then whatever I have left over, then I'll send it to you as, a, as, a, as for my tax. How many of you think the, gov the government would be ex uh, uh, approving of that? Anyone think they would accept that offer? I seriously doubt it. So why do we try giving God what's left over? Look at verse 10. Verse 10, he asks another interesting question. Why don't you just close the church doors? Why don't you just stop pretending that God is important to you because you don't give him your best? Why don't we just shut the doors and forget it? It's useless. God is not pleased. God will not accept it. Then in verses 12 and 13, God uses the words profane, defiled, and contemptible. In fact, he says in verse 13 that you have made worship a burden rather than a blessing. Then in verse 14, the NIV said, calls those who were participating in such activities a cheat. Look at the King James, it says you are a deceiver. When one fails to give their very best, they are cheating themselves and they are cheating God. Now with all of those things in mind, I want to raise the question, when you worship, do you give God your best? Do you give God your firsts? Now you say, preacher, I want to. I really do. So how do I do it? How can I give God my best? So glad you asked that question. Because that's what I want to talk about briefly this morning. I want to give you nine practical suggestions. I know nine and briefly when they come from the mouth of the preacher don't mean the same thing, right? Okay, give you nine suggestions for uh, helping us to give our very best in worshiping Him. Number one, make worship a priority in your life. Make worship a priority in your life. Now I want to give you a little test. A test that you're going to take just inside your own heads, okay? I want you to think about the most important thing you have to do this week. Okay, think about the most important thing you have to do this week. All right? Everybody got it? Everybody understand what they've got to do? What the most important thing they have to do is in your head? Now, if you thought of anything besides worshiping God, perhaps your priorities need to be re realigned. Perhaps they need to be shifted just a bit. If you didn't think worship God as your top priority, where's it at on your list of priorities for this week? I know we're busy people. I understand that. But my friends, if we are too busy to assemble with our fellow Christians for the purpose of worshiping God, then my brothers and sisters, we are too busy. Period. If God can't make the top of our list, then we need to seriously flip our list so that He is at the top of our list. I, I, I love the attitude of David in Psalm 95, verses 1-7. through 7. He says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. 
Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Is that your attitude? Is worship, the worship assembly something that you love to be a part of? Is it something that you miss when you're not a part of it? Is worship a priority for your week? And please understand, I'm talking about every time. I'm not just talking about Sunday morning. You know, I have a friend who says, Sunday mornings are got to, Sunday night and Wednesday night are get to. And what he means by that is you have to be there on Sunday morning. Sunday night and Wednesday night, eh, you can get, if you can get there, that's great, but it's not really required. Okay, but Sunday morning is required. The truth be, if truth were to be told, worship is, is something that we get to do every time. It's not something that we're forced into. It's something that we are allowed to do. It should be looked on as a privilege to assemble with our brothers and sisters every single time the elders have called a worship assembly. And that includes Sunday night and it includes Wednesday night as well. See, the truth be told, if you were, it, when you take a got to approach to worship, you wind up it doing exactly what the Israelites were doing in, my, in Malachi's day. You don't offer your best because instead of seeing it as a privilege, you look on it as a problem. You look at, on it, do you see it as a drudgery? You see it as a, well, I really, I want to do something different, but I got to go to church. And that makes it really tough for you to give your very best. How do you give God your best? Make worship a priority in your life. Number two, make your worship God-centered. Make your worship God-centered. See, we are here for one reason and one reason only this morning, and that is to worship God and please Him. I want you to understand something. I am not here to critique you. I'm not here to look and see who should and shouldn't be taking the Lord's Supper. I'm not here to, to look and see who is and who isn't giving and who is and isn't giving as much as maybe they should be giving. I'm not here to look at the kind of clothes that you are wearing or to analyze your singing ability or your lack thereof. I'm not here to debate with you. I am here to worship God and to give Him my very best. You see, this is a worship service, a worship assembly. It should be God-centered, God-focused, and God honoring. If it is anything else, if it is centered on any other thing, then it is a worship service to that other thing instead of to God. Our preaching, our praying, singing, our communion and giving, all should be God focused. You know, worship is not at the time to solve the world's problems. Uh, it, it, it's a time to focus on God and in so doing begin to solve some of my own problems. My own problems that I have in my relationship with God. Be able to look at it and, and explore it and see how I can do a better job and improve my relationship with Him. And it's not a political rally. You know, it's so strange to me that those people who scream about this separation clause in the United States uh, Constitution and all, and they say separation of church and state, and then they're the ones who go on a Sunday and campaign from the pulpit of a church building somewhere. Isn't that strange? You know, that separation clause, it exists not to, sep not to protect government from the church, 
It exists to protect the church from the government. That's what it's about. It's not, it's not the other way around. But anyway, it's not a political rally. It's not a time to, to focus on some candidate somewhere and what they are or aren't going to do. That's not the purpose of, of, of a worship assembly. If it were, then that worship assembly is worshiping that candidate and not God. So, make your worship God-centered. Number three, involve your heart and not just your lips. It's so easy to just go through the outward motions when our hearts and minds are someplace else, isn't it? It is. It's easy to go through the motions. It's easy to just sing the words to the song without focusing in on understanding exactly what it is they are saying. It's so easy when somebody says a prayer to just sit idly and then when they say amen, say amen, and you didn't even know what you were amening. It's so easy during the communion to just sit and not really think about anything. Just have your mind empty or your mind wander from the events of the cross. So easy to go through the motions without really thinking about what we are doing. So we need to examine ourselves. We must examine ourselves. 1 Corinthians 11.28 speaks about examining ourselves before participating in the Lord's Supper. And that's always a good thing. But I think that that, that applies to other acts of worship as well. That is a unique human quality. The ability to look inside of ourselves. The ability to examine our very thought process, our attitudes, our heart, our disposition, our commitment, or lack thereof, our motives. Oh, how much more meaningful our and encouraging our worship services would be if we would only take the time to prepare. We see the need to pre uh, prepare in so many areas of our lives. And then just jump in the car on Sunday morning and Make it mad rush to the church building. No wonder we fail to give God our best in worship. Involve your heart, not just your lips. Another idea for, for giving God our best. Uh, know where your thoughts are. Make some preparations. Make some preparations. We do physically, don't we? We, we do. We, we, we prepare physically for our attendance at services. When uh, uh, the steps we take, you took a bath, put on deodorant, combed your hair, brushed your teeth, or at least I hope you did. I'm glad too, okay? Don't misunderstand me, I'm glad, all right? But, uh, but we, we need to, uh, there are others who are very meticulous in prepare, preparation of the clothes that they wear. They get dressed, then they look in the mirror, and then they go put on something else. Then they come back and they look in the mirror, then they turn and they talk to their spouse, and then they go back and they put on the first clothes that they had on. Am I talking to anybody here? Okay, yeah, all right. But we pay so much attention to that. But you know what? None of that will help you worship. Do you spend any time getting your spirit ready for worship? We need to. We need to. Do you spend time getting your spirit ready to worship? Or do you sleep as late as you can and rush to church and not really think about anything. We need to prepare ourselves spiritually. Now what would you say if I told you that I never pray before I preach? You would probably say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Surely you pray. I mean, preaching is important. I mean, in times gone by, that's what they called church. We got to go to preaching. You know, uh, <clears throat> surely you pray. I mean, preaching is important. But isn't worship important also? <sighs> Let me give you some suggestions. 
before you come to worship, spend some time in prayer. Spend time praying. Oh, that I would encourage you to spend some time reading. Psalm 95, Psalm 19, Psalm 105. Uh, well, really, a lot of the Psalms will help you focus in on just how great God is and help us focus on God. Spend some time thinking about what you will be doing in committing your, <clears throat> to giving your very best in worship. You might want to make things right <clears throat> with another. You know, the Bible teaches <clears throat> that you cannot worship God acceptably when you have problems with your brothers and sisters. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 18. So, make your preparations. Next, you need to be on time. You need to be on time. In other activities, we see this need, don't we? The need of being on time. When was the last time that you were going to go to a ball game and you left at the very last possible minute? Just barely arriving in time. When it comes to a ball game, we want to be there early, don't we? When it comes to a ball game, whether it's a middle school game or a high school game or uh, the naturals or any, any type of ball game. When it comes to that, we want to be there early. We want to be sure that we get to our seat. Even though we have a ticket that assigns us a seat and nobody else is going to be there, we still want to get there early. So we can be involved and, and see the pregame festivities and activities. We don't want to miss the opening kickoff or tip or the first pitch or whatever it might be. Now as I say that, you might want to say, well, but preacher, a ball game is... Go ahead, finish that thought. A ball game is important. So is worship. Is a ball game more important than worship? Or is it a ball game's more fun? A ball game's more entertaining. You know, this all goes back to preparing your heart. I have a hard time having a sweet, sweet spirit when you've been sprinting, sweating, and, sp and speeding to get to the service. So when I say be here on time, what I really mean is be here early. Get here early so you can talk with your brothers and sisters. Go out of the way or out of your way to meet the visitors that come into our services. Find out what's going on in each other's lives. Sit down and then prepare to worship. And then stay a bit afterwards. Spend some time afterwards fellowshipping and talking. Uh, there are some of you who are sitting here who would be hurt if you needed something from the church and the church did not respond. But you've never given any of the members of this church a chance to get to know you. To know that you maybe have that need. You just think that we know it by osmosis or something. You get mad that nobody helped you but you never let anybody know that you had that need because you got here just before services started and in fact, you didn't even wait for the final amen. You got up in the invitation song and walked out the door and never gave anybody a chance to get to know you. Be on time. Spend time. Bring your Bible. Number six. Be, bring your Bible. I hope that as we looked at Malachi this morning in our scripture, you looked with me. And read along. I hope that when this text was read a few moments ago that you'd, you did spend time reading along and focusing on what the words said. I hope that you maybe took note of certain things in th that this text was saying the Israelites were doing. Maybe mark them to make sure that you aren't guilty of those things. It's hard to have a Bible study without an open Bible, isn't it? I like stories. I like illustrations. But what I want you to take away each week is not some cute little story that I told. What I want you to take away is something that God says. That's what I want you to remember. This week from Malachi 1, God says, When you worship me, I want your very best. 
That is what I want you to hear. That is what I want you to take with you when you walk out the doors. That is what I want to challenge you with this week. And again, I didn't say it. God said it. So bring your Bible. You know, find a nugget of truth to challenge you that week. Next, listen carefully to the sermon. I'm not blowing my own horn, okay? I make no claim to be the best or even one of the better preachers that you will ever hear. I, I'm not, I don't claim that. But this I promise you, I work hard every week to put together some thoughts that will challenge you to be a little bit more like what God would have you to be. I have put together some thoughts, hopefully work hard to encourage you to have the desire to be what God would have you to be. And I know that I don't hit a home run every week. I, I'm aware of that. This might be one of those weeks I don't hit a home run, but I at least want to get on base, okay? Okay. I at least want to give you something to think about. Something to challenge you. Forget the preacher. Forget the, his ability. What if this were the last sermon that you ever heard before you left this world? Would you listen and hear, try and hear something that would help draw you closer to God if you knew that you were about to be in the presence of God? Would you find at least some nugget of truth that would help you? Plan your week some other time. Play with the kids some other time. You know, it's better training for them anyway to, to see their mom and their dad paying attention and focused on what's going on. When you come to worship, listen to the sermon. You'll, you'll hear so much from the, wor from the world the rest of the week. I mean, the wor rest of the, wor the world has six days to, to play with your brain and try and shape you into its mold. We have this one opportunity. Focus for a few minutes on a word from God. Then number seven, be a participant, not a spectator. Worship is not a spectator sport. We are not here to watch. We are not here to observe or to critique or ju to just sit idly. We are here to worship. So sit up and sing. And when we're led in a prayer, listen. During communion, focus on the cross. When scripture is read and sermons preached, get into it. Worship is not a spectator sport. The only spectator is God. God is your only audience in worship. Not the person sitting next to you, not the person in front of you or behind you. God is the center of the worship. He is your only audience. You are an active participant. So how are you doing? Next, expect something wonderful to happen. Expect something wonderful to happen in worship, finally. Allow me to share a fact that is true in most all areas of life and equally true in the worship service. One usually gets out what, what, an event what one puts in and what one expects to get out of it. Isn't that right? What did you expect this morning when you came to worship services? That's probably what you're going to get out of it. If you expect worship to be challenging, if you expect worship services to be life-changing experience, it can very well be that. Now some of you might be asking, be saying, Preacher, it isn't that for me. So what is the problem? Well, might I suggest that you look in your seat? I'm not talking about where you're sitting. I'm talking about here, let me let you borrow my mirror. Okay? Because you see, what the problem could very well be is with us. Nobody can keep me from sitting up and singing my heart out. 
Nobody can keep me from humbling my heart and praying to God. Nobody can keep me from focusing on the cross as I partake of the Lord's Supper. Nobody can keep me from finding a life-changing truth as Scripture is read and studied and discussed. Nobody can keep me from, cha from challenging and encouraging my brothers and sisters in Christ as we come together and worship together. Nobody that is except for me. And I will probably get exactly what I expect. What do you expect this morning? Did you, did, do you expect God to be glorified? The lost to be saved? The weak to be strengthened? The strong to be encouraged? Have you prior to this assembly prayed for those things to happen? What did you expect? Again, you are probably going to get out of a worship assembly what you expect to get out of it. I don't want to be like those in Malachi's day. I don't want to, my worship to be second-rate leftovers that God rejects, whether it's my preaching or praying or singing or the Lord's Supper or my giving. How about you? Nine suggestions to help keep that from happening. Make your worship God, of God a priority. Make your worship God-centered. Put your heart into it. Prepare before coming to worship. Be on time. Bring your Bible. Listen. Participate. And expect great things to happen. Expect wonderful things to happen to you and to those around you. You see, it's very important. Not just in what we give out of our checkbook, in our bank account. It's very important that in everything that we do, we give God our firsts. We make God our number one. And again, that's not what I said. That's what God says. If God is not going to be number one in your life, then you may as well not even have God in your life. Because that's how serious He is about being in that top spot. This morning, is He in that top spot in your life? If He's not, you can make Him that top spot. Maybe making Him that top spot simply requires you to pray where you're, you're at. Saying, God, I know that in my personal life I have not been living out what You would have me do. I know that in my personal life You haven't been number one. And I want You to be. Perhaps it involves a public request for prayer. Perhaps it requires a public response for baptism. To make Him your Lord. To tell Him you want Him to be number one and you want to keep Him number one in your life from now on. Whether that response is public or private, we want to give you the opportunity to respond. We want to make you give you the opportunity to begin today to give God your first to give God your best if we can help you to do that in some way and a public response is necessary won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing